internet in the year 2015. We send emails, make calls, and discuss issues of interest. Even our banking, shopping, education, amongst others, are going virtual. But what has been taken for granted today was only a vague idea about 50 years ago. The internet has always been an emerging technology and an emerging ideal. But despite being a very important tool in this millennium, only 3.2 of the world's 7 billion people use the internet. However, according to the figures obtained from the international web stats, of that number, Africa is responsible for over 300 million, while Nigeria is responsible for over 70 million. My name is Victor Mathias, and I'll be bringing you stories on how the internet has made and is still making an impact on the world. Despite the slow broadband penetration in the country, Nigeria still has a steady and impressive growth rate in mobile internet penetration, according to recent statistics released by the Nigerian Communications Commission, NCC. The statistics, which was posted on the NCC's website, showed that the total mobile internet penetration across GSM operators' networks was over 80 million, which was an improvement from the previous months. Experts, however, say the figure must have exceeded 100 million currently, given its steady growth rate if sustained. Being a powerful platform for the freedom of expression around the world, it has also been abused by people who choose to use it to spread lies, misinformation and personal threats targeted at individuals or groups. So the governance of the internet has therefore become a major global issue. This journey to bring you stories and testimonies on how the internet has made an impact on the lives of people and how its use will benefit you begins in the United States of America, where I will be speaking with a professor of communication at the American University, the globally recognized internet governance scholar, Dr. Laura Denidis. Dr. Denidis began by stating unequivocally that the internet is governed, but maintains that countries are responsible for how users make use of the internet in their countries and strike a balance between internet privacy and the occurrence of the rule of law. It's a really complicated uh, issue and an important one because we expect governments to focus on national security and keeping citizens safe in a world that is dangerous. And on the other hand, we expect to have the right to speak and to have a certain amount of privacy. So, so the question really is, how can you have a balance between the privacy that we need as citizens and our expectation for governments to keep us safe? And I think that that, can, uh, that balance can be struck online. Uh, for example, I can expect to have the right to speak anonymously online so that the general population can't see who I am. But then there could be some way through a court order for governments to find out um, who someone is if something dangerous is happening online. Whether you want to call that traceable anonymity or court-ordered um, enforcement, I think there is a way to have a degree of privacy and also allow the rule of law to occur. Just like associations and citizens hold their governments to ransom through protest over unpopular policies, the SOPA and PIPA acts in the United States and the cybercrime bill in Nigeria were greeted by massive protests, which led to the shelving of the bills by both the United States and Nigerian lawmakers. Dr. Denidis explains that such bills could be used to stop online privacy and other unacceptable online practices. What the Stop Online Piracy Act in the United States sought to do is to have um, more techniques to be able to stop piracy legally. There was a huge outcry over this law and the reason for it is somewhat technical. It's because part of what the Stop Online Piracy Act would have done is use the domain name system of the internet, which is a fundamental technology that keeps it operational, translating names like CNN.com into the numbers it would have used that and altered it a little bit to uh, stop piracy. So it was a very complicated issue. The internet community had um, a boycott over it and ultimately it was shelved. The internet, just like every other phenomenon, has its good and bad side. A fact, Dr. Denidis says, people all over the world have no choice but to live with. 
one of the dark side is that we can't believe everything that we read online. And just as in the real world, there's the same kind of propaganda or defamation or false statements online or threats. So if in a case where it's not illegal what someone is saying, it's just something that we have to live with. Life has become much more interesting with the advent of smartphones, smart cars, smart wristwatches, smart TVs, smart glasses, and even smart kids. But how will all these technological innovations help cities to be smart? Kansas City is the largest city in the state of Missouri. It is the 37th largest city by population in the United States and the 23rd largest by area. Kansas City will serve as a test bed for a slew of smart cities technologies from vendors like Cisco, Sprint, Sensity Systems and Black and & Beach where ultra-efficient transportation, advanced power grids that seamlessly integrate renewable energy and futuristic urban gardens are helping to feed growing population of city dwellers. These are just a few of the optimistic outlooks surrounding smart cities, a genre that has become increasingly hard to ignore in recent years. I begin my journey in Kansas by visiting the president of KC Next, Ryan Rubber, to find out what the Kansas Smart Project is all about, how it will be executed, and who will be involved. In this project that Cisco announced, uh, these partnerships, like you said, with the city of Kansas City, Missouri, and then Sprint and Black and & Veatch, and then a local technology incubator called Think Big Partners. And that's really a place where tech companies can work uh, for short-term leases and really test and, and be in an environment that promotes entrepreneurship and innovation. But we don't really know. And that's what's kind of exciting because this could be something that uh, this partnership, this collaboration of companies, they're going to install a lot of infrastructure and software and new products along a streetcar line here in Kansas City. and they're going to find and learn a lot of things. They're going to create a lot of data. Uh, the real beauty of this is that this project is open for anybody to come to Kansas City and test their ideas on what's being called a living laboratory. So um, this living lab will be an opportunity with the collaboration of the companies and the incubator I mentioned to really come and test ideas on this new infrastructure. The streetcar project is a pivotal part of the project, and we take a ride downtown to meet with the principal of Copacan Groups and a member of the Downtown Council and Streetcar Authority to fill us in on how these cars tend to feature in the Smart City Project. First of all, it gets people um, within the downtown urban environment moving around more. So if you have a meeting or you have a lunch um, or you want to go somewhere, instead of getting in your car getting your car out of the garage, maybe saying, ah, that's too much of a hassle, I'm not going to do it, you can hop on the streetcar system. And you know, right now, for the foreseeable future, it's a free system. So anybody who wants to ride uh, can ride. In the future, um, expansion of the system is important. So while people are building and concentrating development around the streetcar, um, we really need also the opportunity to bring people into our downtown from the line because right now the line is a starter line within downtown and everybody's very optimistic that it'll be very meaningful but you do need to access further pieces of the population in order to bring those people as well downtown. I however take the conversation outside and who best to talk to but the man in charge, the executive director of the KC Streetcar System, Tom Gerard. So what you're looking at is the two-mile modern streetcar project that's being built in downtown Kansas City. We're going to have four modern streetcar vehicles that are going to run up and down Main Street approximately every 10 minutes to collect passengers about every two blocks we're going to have a stop. And the system's going to be free to ride. Really the goal is to bring residents, visitors, and employment and employees to businesses up and down the court. We've been planning for rail transit in downtown Kansas City for literally decades. And so this is the culmination of years and years and years of work. Started with planning, developing uh, proposals that were really supported strongly by the downtown business community and also by the elected officials in Kansas City. We're looking at infrastructure in downtown Kansas City that was over 100 years old sewer lines, water lines that needed to be replaced, all of the private uh, telecommunications, fiber optic lines, telephone lines, internet lines that had to also be moved and replaced to accommodate the track. So lots of 
detailed work went into relocating utilities and also investing in some of the basic infrastructure like sewer and water replacements underneath the track slab so we could have not just a streetcar service but we could have the public utilities that were also reliable and dependable and wouldn't have to be replaced or torn up years after the project was started. But Kansas is not all about the construction of a smart city. For what is a smart city without smart people to make use of the smart amenities? So, we make a stop at the Kansas City Library and meet up with a bunch of kids who are managed by a digital youth engagement manager, Andrew Ellis. Weekly, these youngsters share their experiences with each other to encourage and help keep off crime and juvenile delinquencies. Andrea Ellis tells us how these kids are managed tutored and unleashed on the tech world. Initially we started and it was totally open and you could do whatever you want. What we found is that a lot of the youth that we work with weren't quite sure what they wanted to do. You know, they knew they were interested in technology and they want to do something cool, but what to do with it? So what we started to do was have what we call intensives. So we would focus on a particular thing like audio and video production for six weeks or game design for six weeks or 3D design for six weeks. And what we have found is that kind of gives them a little bit of an understanding now of what is possible and then they can start to think about their own projects that they want to work on. One of our large-scale projects that we did with one of our branch libraries was with Minecraft. You know, a lot of kids are playing Minecraft these days. Have you seen that that game platform? It's, it's, it's yeah, the kids absolutely love it. Not quite sure why, because when I tried to play it, I was like, yeah, this is not, this is not working for me. But they can go in and they can build whole worlds. And so we worked with them um, our lead facilitator, Marcus Brown, I introduced you to, worked with two of our branches to have the kids build their ideal neighborhoods in Minecraft. So not necessarily the neighborhood that you live in, but what would you want if you could have the neighborhood of your choice? And so they had to go in and start thinking about, okay, we're going to build houses. Uh, well, where, where do those houses, how far apart do those houses have to be? How, uh, what kind of streets do we need to create? And so, as you might imagine, they wanted to create things like streets of gold and streets of diamonds. And what that lends to is an opportunity for us to talk to them about well, would it really make sense to have a street of gold? How long would that street of gold really last? You know, so it gets them to start thinking in some ways about urban planning in a very kind of short time frame, right? So we worked with them um, and they built it around the libraries in their particular areas and then they kind of built the houses and the businesses around that. So that was a really fantastic project to work on. Kansas City, Missouri-based engineering and construction company Black & Beach caps the quartet collaborating with the city to bring the Smart City project into fruition. On its part, Black & Beach will ensure that the water system provides advanced leak detection, predictive maintenance and asset management solutions to decrease costs. At Black & Beach, I am made to understand that smart cities are not built without the incremental pieces connected, and these include pervasive wireless coverage, transformation of public carrier business plans to accommodate the Internet of Everything, miniaturization of processors, and the integration of communication modules into intelligent devices, abundant cheap data storage and processing power, rise of cloud computing and edge computing, access to vast data streams enabling potential for rich analytics, and extensive improvements in applications development and visual display capabilities. These seven factors enable the rise of a smart integrated infrastructure. We take a tour of Black & Veatch to understand how it operates to put all these together. And this is our first stop. What we're looking at right now is just a list of these alerts. So we're, we're interact, or interfacing with uh, a wealth of data, tons and tons of data. So for, for one power generating unit, We'll pull in maybe 5,000 data points. We pull those in every minute. Uh, and then our, our statistical, our mathematical models learn the behavior. So they're able to tell us, hey, right now we expect this value to be X based on, on history. The second. When it comes to our solar PV installation, we have the microinverter panels, uh, the monocrystalline panels, and the polycrystalline panels. And integrating all different types of these technologies has allowed us to really uh, play with this system. It's really malleable and, and it's uh, been a lot of fun for our engineers to be able to understand these types of systems. When it comes to grid resiliency, um, sustainability, and even cost effectiveness, we're able to use these different types of technologies to, to run those calculations and really uh, fill out that 
that, that feel for what a smart city looks like, having renewable generation on site, but also coupling that with our battery system in the basement and our on-site uh, natural gas generation uh, to be able to, to provide behind the meter energy storage and uh, on-site generation. And third. Microgrids play a key role in smart cities, it's not just because of the penetration of renewable energy sources, which is all clean energy, and we're talking about sustainability, and we also threw in Fred talked about this too, we're talking about resiliency and reliability, but also because when you, when you look at all the systems, the different generation sources we've got here for our microgrid, everything has got a smart controller. So all these controllers could be spoken to. And when you're talking about cities like Chicago, if you look at the news, everybody's exploring. Kansas City, KCPNL had worked on a smart grid for in Kansas City, which has got a one megawatt battery energy storage system. The several rooftop solar that we've done in Missouri are part of that. Some of the rooftop solar that we've done are part of that as well. So it gives you a way to communicate. But after the tour and tutorial from the technical team, we break words with those at the helm of affairs. Well, the benefit I see as we deliver our infrastructure is that we have the knowledge, expertise, and talent to really bring to bear solutions to help the municipalities or utilities, whatever the entity might be, the public entity might be. So those benefits really are that you work together. Anytime you're able to collaborate and work together, you're going to get a much better outcome. Now, some of the risk might be that People get concerned about what that relationship is and the enterprise and you know, what kind of profits and those kinds of things. But in actuality, the risk really, in my view, are that we don't come together. Because if we don't come together, I think it's going to take us longer and longer to put the critical infrastructure in place and really to keep moving. The Smart Cities Initiative, that's an opportunity in many ways to get it right the first time because you can skip over steps that we've had to take in the past, but now we have the data analytics, we have the technology and all of that in place so we can accelerate the implementation of the infrastructure that we need. So that's the risk in my view, is that we don't partner and get it right the first time. Smart cities in the world. Exactly. Fred Elamaya, the Vice President, yes. Smart Integrated Infrastructure of Black and Beach gives an in-depth plan of the project, who beneficiaries will be, challenges encountered, roles of partners and possibilities of new partners. The best part about a smart city plan is that the consumer gets to benefit from the better efficiency, the better connectivity, the ability to interact with the city, to have a better, better customer experience. And that is the really the fundamental component of a smart city is that the citizens of the community get to benefit from the systems being built, whether that's ease of parking, more safe streets because of the smart street lighting systems that have video as a sensor and other sensor capabilities coming from them. So it really is based on citizen engagement, citizen involvement and improvement of life uh, for, for our citizens. Sandra Beyer from the Smart City Council. She gives us a breakdown on the council's activities, some examples of smart cities and a word of advice to African countries. I think the most important um, part of what uh, the Smart Cities Council does is to help cities look across cross-cutting uh, uh, departments and really help them figure out what to do first and how to begin the process. Yep. San Diego is a good example of um, what they're doing with um, energy. They uh, have figured out a number of ways in which they're trying to become more energy efficient, to conserve energy, to develop um, property and do it in a very sustainable way. So I think San Diego is taking the lead on that. Um, there are other cities, um, there's a good example in New Bedford, Massachusetts. New Bedford, Massachusetts is a relatively small town on the east coast of the U.S. Um, they uh, decided, the mayor uh, named John Mitchell, who's a very strong leader, decided that, that the city needed um, to figure out new ways to make that city more attractive to its residents and to bring it, give it a character, a brand that no other city had. So the mayor worked with several companies, some of which are partners of the Smart Cities Council, to um, get funding for wind turbines because they have a lot of wind off the east coast of uh, Massachusetts. And so today they are actually call themselves the Saudi Arabia of wind because they're very effectively using wind power to, um, to power the city. They've also moved into solar. So I think a lot of cities are figuring out where are the opportunities for us to distinguish ourselves, for us to be um, a special city in the eyes of our citizens and in the eyes of the world. The big advice we give, um, actually to all cities, but it's a 
particularly appropriate for African cities is to think big but start small. To think about what are the big issues that are facing African um, cities, but also to figure out some small wins, some successes that can be done early on so that citizens are engaged and they have a voice in what's going on. Are we really helping them?